everyone. I'm Mike Rowan. And I'm Casey Cook. Welcome to the first full episode of Cortex, Course America's new video podcast interview series where we talk about technology, creativity, innovation, and what we can do to get through this coronavirus pandemic together. Yes. And today we are very excited to be kicking off this series talking about an emerging technology that is beginning to allow choral singers to sing remotely, but also together in sync while hearing the other singers that are that are singing at the same time. And it's it's really um, a revelation and perhaps the closest thing that we can be doing right now to, to gathering in person if we're not able to gather in person and sing right now. So, so this is big, Casey. Yeah, we got contacted by Kent Jew from the Ragazzi Boys Chorus, who was working with uh, one of their board members, who's also the father of one of the singers in the Boys Chorus, who uh, is a software developer. And they were working on a plug and play set of software and hardware where they could send the gear to the singers, they could set it all up, and then as they're singing, they can hear their fellow singers in their ear live. Um, I think we're all fairly used to doing Zoom calls now, which are great. It's a great way to keep in touch with people, but you can't really rehearse music over it. There's too much lag. There's not a lot of ways to be able to, to hear things and speak or sing at the same time. Uh, but this little collection of technology, hardware, uh, allows you to overcome that. So you can be listening and singing simultaneously and receive feedback from the people you're used to singing with. Kent Ju is the artistic and executive director of Ragazzi Boys Chorus, which was founded in 1987 and serves over 250 boys and young men between the ages of five and 18. Kent is a choral conductor, music educator, adjudicator, guest clinician, workshop presenter, and mentor and he has prepared ensembles for performances with organizations in addition to Ragazzi that include San Francisco Symphony, Symphony Silicon Valley, Opera San Jose, and West Bay Opera. Mike Dickey is a software developer and entrepreneur, as well as a board member of Ragazzi Boys Chorus and a parent of one of its singers. Mike has built and sold three startup companies in Silicon Valley, and his most recent project is the Jack Trip Foundation a project dedicated to advancing technologies that enable music collaborations that transcend distance constraints. Mike serves as its co-founder and co-chair. Joining us now are Kent and Mike. Welcome to you both. Thank you so much for coming on and talking with us today. Absolutely, thanks, thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Um, so just to start off, how is life going for you right now? You're in the Bay Area. What is life like down there? Um, I know you've, you know, you've had some environmental crises going on. Um, just how are you doing? I feel like we're doing better than we were. Uh, certainly the, the fires, the wildfires were uh, very difficult to uh, work with for a while, not being able to go outside on top of the pandemic was a big challenge for everyone, especially our children. Um, the last several weeks, however, have been much nicer. Um, at least in the Bay Area, our air quality is very good. And I think the, the fires are doing better than they were. So improved from my perspective. That's really great to hear. We're also uh, slowly uh, opening up on a very minimal level. Uh, I think uh, some of the schools are opening up with uh, some waivers and um, restaurants and businesses are able to um, serve their clients on, on a very uh, minimal basis. But for us, that's a step in the right direction. So we're here to talk about a technology that you've been working with that's very exciting that allows singers, a high number of singers to sing remotely in sync at the same time. Um, and so I wanna start out, you know, we're gonna I go through, I think all the ins and outs of this as we talk, but just sort of upfront since this is kind of the thing that other than meeting in person again, the, the choral field has been waiting to hear about, um, to be able to sing together um, since we miss it so much, um, does this work? 
And I guess what I mean by that is you can give your best sort of like clear eyed assessment of, you know, does this technology um, add to what we've been able to do in a meaningful way that we haven't been able to do in Zoom with, we know all of the lag um, and, and the other platforms? Yeah, I think uh, the, the positive side of it is, yes, it, it does work and it is working for hundreds of people. And for the first time in several months, they're able to sing again. And uh, for especially for, for certain tempos and if you're within a certain distance of other people, then you're likely to have a very great experience. Uh, the one thing to note is that it, it doesn't work for everyone. Unfortunately, it's not the, the final end all solution to the problem, at least yet, uh, there's a few things that have to be taken into account. One is your your own home internet connection is probably the biggest one. Um, you know, it's only as good as your internet connection. If your internet connection is having trouble or is a little slow, then you're going to have additional lag versus other chorus members. The other aspect of it is geographical distance. Um, there, there is a limitation in terms of the latency barriers that you need to be within um, about 600 miles or a thousand kilometers of all the other participants that you're singing with. And, uh, and that's a, a challenge for some groups today. And then the third limitation is uh, availability. Um, now, well, with JackTrip, anyone can run their own audio server anywhere they want to. Um, the, the virtual studio service, uh, one of the aspects of it is that it makes it very easy to run those audio servers by us doing it for you by using cloud computing services. Um, the downside of that benefit is that uh, that's only available currently in certain locations, uh, in particular only certain locations in the United States right now. And uh, we're planning to expand that reach to more locations, many more locations, both in the US and then as well around the world. So over time, we hope to be able to uh, make it more accessible and available to a much broader audience. Mike, I've kind of played around with uh, Jack Trip, just trying to set it up uh, to work with choirs, or I've, I've watched uh, a good presentation of someone trying to show me how to set up a Jack, Jack Trip server, and it seemed rather complicated. Uh, what's the setup like this for, and sort of what components are needed, and is this something that your run-of-the-mill person that is comfortable using computers could set up on their own? Yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm a techie myself, and uh, when I was looking at different solutions that were out there just several months ago, uh, and I stumbled across JackTrip, I also myself felt that it was probably the most complicated and difficult to set up and use solution that was out there, and, and even struggled with it myself a little bit, you know, because you had to effectively compile it from source code to get a working version. It was a command line tool, you had to manage different settings. So it, it required a fairly high level of, of tech uh, capability. And uh, so that's where I, I, I focus all of my energy and that's where um, our virtual studio product comes into play is that the last several months have focused on building additional technology and uh, capability around that to make it as easy as possible to get going with. So today um, we, have, we have it down to the point where it's just a simple device, it's a box. And this is a full-blown computer. You don't need a separate laptop or desktop to work with this. You can use your phone or your, your iPad. And, um, and it, you, you basically just plug your microphone into this, you plug your headphones into this, plug your ethernet into this, and you plug your power into this. And, um, and then from there, you can use your phone to do everything. You don't have to, uh, to do any command line work or even have a monitor or keyboard set up. Uh, it makes it very, very easy for uh, a much broader audience to get started. That's a really helpful explanation. And can we, so I know that um, you've said that it's only available in certain places for right now, um, but I'm interested to sort of like walk through um, since you're hoping to expand, you know, let's say we're starting at the point of it's available in your region. Um, what, what are the steps required to, to get that set up so that you're ready to sing with a choir from, from everybody's home? 
So the, the first step is you need to have one of these devices. And these, this is standard hardware that's available online. You can buy the parts and piece it together. And on our website, we have the, uh, the list of where to buy everything if you'd like to assemble it yourself. Uh, we also, uh, as a Jack Trip Foundation, uh, we're helping to make this available in a pre-assembled form so that it's all built for you and it has the, the card imaged for you and everything so that you can just take the box and plug it in. And uh, we're trying to do that at uh, as low a cost as, as feasible uh, because we're a nonprofit or we're, we're more interested in proliferation versus the, the profit aspect of it. Uh, but the first step is basically just getting, getting the device and then plugging it in. And uh, from there, you can use your a browser either on your, your phone or, or iPad or you know, laptop or desktop um, to, to go in and register the device to an account. And from there, it's all a, a web application. So a web service, just like uh, any other web service you're, you're probably using, um, where you can go in and you can configure the device, you can control the settings, you can control um, the audio servers, who you're connecting to, connecting to who you're playing with. Uh, all through that web application. Awesome. And Kent, can we extend this to you and ask sort of from the conductor side, um, is, is what Mike said, does that cover it uh, from your perspective or as the conductor, do you have sort of additional elements of your setup? Well, I I'll just start by concurring with Mike that the the setup works and it is a game changer, especially for us here in the Bay Area where um, in-person choral rehearsals inside are not happening, period. So uh, while different regions in the United States and in the world have different, um, I think, uh, availability to rehearse right now, this is our only option. And uh, it was pretty glorious, I think, to see the boys faces light up after hearing their uh, buddies sing for the first time together um, after you know six six months um, and I think it just speaks to the sort of depth of uh, our loss of of what we find so dear in choral music um, so yes and I'm, I'm so grateful that Mike has uh, taken on this challenge because um, you know, it's changed our lives. Um, some additional setups I think that we have uh, found helpful, and this is sort of um, by trial and error, uh, we find that for our boys, a mic stand is really helpful. We've been hooking up electric keyboards, you know, into mixers with the mic to try and get better sound. Uh, we've been playing with click tracks and uh, metronomes because the video, um, there's still latency in the video, we're using Zoom. Um, and so we've almost come to agreement that um, the visual is um, not helpful. Um, so we've been relying and focusing more on the oral aspect of what we're doing. And I think it's really um, helping us as adults and conductors and also the boys to uh, use that inherent musicianship and really hone in on the listening skills, which is great. And uh, that will um, help, help us be better musicians now and uh, in the future too, so. Yeah, that was gonna be my, my follow-up question. Um, as a conductor myself, I've, I'm, I'm trying to do some virtual choir things that are sort of acapella and require asynchronous recording to go on watching a conducting track. With something like this, I would imagine repertoire that gears towards like uh, accompanied with a piano or something where there's sort of a percussive beat always going or or with a click track where you can hear the tempo through the audio feed because videos just takes up so much more bandwidth than this. You would want to have something like that leading the fray as opposed to a visual like a conductor doing something. Yeah, so I've you know, I've been experimenting with being a verbal click track by counting the beats as we go along. Um, and I think, Casey, you're absolutely right. Pieces that have a lot of um, rubato or, um, you know, fermatas and cutoffs just are more challenging. Um, that's not to say that we're not doing them. And it's actually intriguing to figure out, well, I wonder how we can, how we can make that work um, in, in this setting because um, we don't want to uh, only limit ourselves to pieces that have no tempo changes and 
sing straight through. Um, and, you know, again, I think Mike has given us the opportunity to explore those questions. And this is all part of our uh, music education learning uh, at this time. As my colleague at Jack Trip likes to say, it tends to make your ears bigger. You know, you, you listen a lot more carefully and you, you focus a lot more on the sound than you normally would uh, without having the visual aspect as readily available. Yeah, that's really interesting. And so Kent, as a conductor, do you, do you find any truth to that for yourself, using your ears differently or challenges of trying to lead a group in different ways other than being the person that you can see um, and the motion of your hands and that guiding the, the singing process? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, I still find myself conducting, uh, even though I know uh, you can't you can't help it. But while I'm holding music or I'm trying to move the microphone or sometimes I'm turning over to play the keyboard, um, I, I think the hardest aspect is that uh, the the one-on-one the one -on or the one -on -one interaction, the human contact, it's really hard obviously over Zoom. And I think with boys and kids especially, um, it's hard to read them and, um, and so I think that we're learning, or I'm learning, and I have a, a, a real interest in how to um, create more of an interpersonal relationship in this sort of um, very impersonal <laughs> setup. And um, th that's missing. And, I, you know, and um, we've definitely tried different things um, to continue to um, create community, which is really important and why our boys are here and why many of us sing in choruses because of the community and the aspect of singing together. Um, so we've been working um, on that. Um, and I, I think my ears are, have been really listening uh, more carefully. Uh, I'm, a, I'm lucky that I know most of these boys already because I've worked with them. Uh, so I, I think I'm getting good at um, pinpointing individual voices uh, and, and um, trying to uh, encourage uh, you know, them personally to uh, perhaps do different things. But my ears have definitely grown, I think, in both listening for their voices and the work that we're producing. I know that I am ready to get back to a time when we can all sing together in the same room, but I'm also finding that a lot of the things we're developing in the time of coronavirus is some different techniques uh, that we're using currently that I like, for example, I think there's uh, a lot of benefit in recording sectional work for individual sections that they can come back to and rehearse if they need to. Do you think once we're past all of the coronavirus stuff, is this something that we can continue to use in some capacity uh, or as a supplement to rehearsals as we move forward? Well, absolutely. We have uh, deployed all of our companies to make rehearsal tracks. Um, we have, uh, this was back in the spring when we first uh, canceled our in-person rehearsals. Uh, we de developed systems for kids to make recordings, to send them to the directors. The directors um, have been sending them back with feedback. And uh, that um, is actually not new technology, obviously, but became um, crucial, I think, in the beginning of the pandemic. And um, we will definitely use all of those uh, platforms that we developed um, to, to solicit um, more growth, individual growth um, in the future. And I, I think one interesting aspect of sort of this virtual learning is that it, you know, we have quite a bit of um, rush hour traffic during our rehearsal period uh, here in the Bay Area. And we actually, some people came to us because we are now virtual, because they didn't have to deal with the commute issue. So I think that you know, choruses are going to deal with maybe this is not a uh, complete substitution, but I think that there are going to be ways to develop um, a different type of choral rehearsal setting that includes these uh, new technologies. That's really nice news to hear that you've been getting singers now that you, 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 that you had not reached before. Um, that sounds like a really nice silver lining. We are uh, definitely very grateful for the families who are, have signed up uh, for our program. 
I'm interested to hear um, a little bit uh, from you both, I, th I think, um, but a, a little bit of the, the breakdown of the, the cost of getting set up and, um, you know, any, any accessibility um, questions that, that may have sort of like crossed your mind or strategies to, that, that may help choruses um, provide for, you know, all singers, you know, if, if there's a, a question of budget, if, you, if that's something that has crossed your mind yet, um, but, but just hearing a little bit about sort of like the, what's, what's involved cost-wise to, to get set up. Yeah, I'd say the, the the first initial cost is the actual purchase of the the device hardware, and and this costs about one hundred fifty dollars US. Um, in addition to this, you need to purchase uh, accessories that go with it. In, for example, a microphone, power adapter, um, a, a power power cord, a um, microphone cable and a adapter for your headphones and all in all uh, based on the recommendations that we have on our site it costs about $200 uh, assuming you have some other pair of headphones that you can use for it um, obviously that's that's a high it's higher than we would like we would like it to be very, much lower or ideally free for everybody <laughs> um, but uh, that's not possible so what, one of the things that I want to mention is that the, although the devices are, are probably the, the easiest and most streamlined way to get started, and they're, they're the easiest to use, easiest to set up, and they have the lowest latency because of the hardware that's built into them, they're not the only option available. Uh, the JackTrip software itself is open source, and as Casey mentioned, you can download it, you can install it on your laptop or desktop, and you can use it with your existing computer. Um, there are there are downsides of that. Um, we're trying to also make that software as easy to use as possible in, in parallel. Uh, but there's also issues with the, the audio latency on, on most computers that come into play with that. So it, it is an option if you are unable to, to purchase the device, though. So it's something to consider. The other thing to mention is that we we decided to create the Jack Trip Foundation and to do this as a nonprofit with the intention of being able to raise grant funds that we could use to help um, help schools and other educational institutions uh, buy these devices. Uh, we know that it's it's a big barrier for many, and accessibility is a is a big challenge for many. So we'd like to be able to help out as many as we can. And while we're, we're still very early in that process, that is one of the things that we're, we're that's a big part of our, our mission and our focus is to try to help organizations that can't afford this on their own. Just for us data nerds out there, Mike, um, what is the, what's the, what's the latency on uh, this, this piece of software, piece of hardware, and what are we typically dealing with if we're using something like Zoom, which doesn't even allow for multiple streams to be going actively simultaneously? Yeah, that's a great question. So for Zoom, the, the typical latency is in the hundreds of milliseconds. And um, the, the science, that's the research that's been done on it indicates that in order to perform music together with one another well, uh, you need to be under about 25 milliseconds. And, and it does vary based on the tempo and other aspects, but that's the, the general guidance. So Zoom, that, that's why Zoom doesn't work, is it's in the hundreds when you need 25. Um, on most la laptops and desktop computers, the ones that, at least that I've measured, um, on, on Macs, they're in the 10 to 30 millisecond range of the audio hardware. And on, on Windows, uh, the ones that I measured are over 100 milliseconds, just in the audio hardware that's built into the computers. Now, you can get other external USB devices that plug into your computer that have lower latencies, but those themselves tend to cost $100 or more just for those USB devices. Um, so that's what you're looking at is uh, the, the, the unfortunate truth is that when, you're, when your audio device, your audio hardware already has a 10 to 20 millisecond latency, that really doesn't leave any room for your internet connection. And um, that, that's why it's, it's very difficult to make this stuff work. Um, with these devices, the latency of the hardware is only one millisecond. So that leaves a, a great deal of room for internet connection and other things in order to give you the lowest latency possible. 
So to get some clarification on that, make sure I'm understanding correctly. Um, so you're, you're saying that uh, different kinds of computers have different types or different amounts of latency that are just baked in. Um, but with this device that you're using, um, that means just using that, that device and plugging your singing equipment into that, you bypass all of that. So it, it doesn't matter whether you have a Windows laptop or a Mac laptop or tablet or home computer at home because everything is just going through that device and your internet connection. Is that correct? That's that's right. Um, and and if, you're, if your hardware latency is high, it really doesn't matter what the software does. No matter what software you, you try, it's, it's only going to be as fast as your audio hardware performance. And, and that's why we're trying to, to take out the audio hardware performance from the equation. Great. Thanks for explaining that. Um, when it comes to internet, I guess I turn, I think as sort of a non-tech expert person, I think in terms of like what the different plans are that you can buy from Comcast or Verizon or, or whatever it might be. Um, and Mike, you mentioned that um, the the internet connection um, is is a factor and a limitation, and so what what I've heard, um, I, I think, or what I've read is that you know sort of like a you know a basic or average, or I'm forgetting the exact term, but like a home internet connection can support this type of singing activity. Um, does that mean? you know, like the the top of the line, the like the the highest price internet package is what's necessary or or the lowest, or is it somewhere in the middle? Any any sort of insights on that? Yeah, and it, it, it's, it's an aspect that's often very confusing for people uh, because bandwidth and latency are two different measurements and the internet service providers typically advertise internet connections solely in terms of the bandwidth performance capabilities. So the more bandwidth you, you get from them, typically the more you pay for your internet connection. Um, the, the fact is, is that the, the bandwidth is, is a relatively low requirement for these devices in the sense that you only need about five megabits, uh, both upload and download of bandwidth. And most even of the lowest cost internet plans that are available will, will have that available, at least in, you know, in, in especially in metropolitan areas. Um, I mean, certainly there's many areas in the world that don't have as good internet connection, connectivity. Um, in terms of the latency, that's really the, the most important aspect, and it's not correlated to bandwidth. So if you have a very, very high bandwidth gigabit connection, you can still have pretty poor latency. And in fact, many we, we've seen many that have that, um, that case. So my, my general guidance is, first and foremost, if you have a fiber, in, fiber to the home internet provider available, either uh, Verizon Fios or AT&T Fiber or Google Fiber or one of those, always go with that. That's, that's your best choice because the fiber connection, even if you purchase a very low bandwidth rate, is going to be your best bet. Um, what you, you can actually get latency uh, as low as 10 milliseconds with, with a fiber connection. Uh, in my home, for example, I have a seven millisecond round trip to our San, San Francisco server. So you can do very, very tight, very fast tempo pieces if, if everybody is, is on that kind of a connection. Um, unfortunately, fiber is still gradually rolling out in, in many areas. And even, even here, it just became available in Silicon Valley, center of Silicon Valley, just a, a few months ago. So um, many, many, most people probably don't have that available to them. And in those cases, you just want to try to to find a provider that offers a, a good quality package with, that meets the minimum bandwidth requirements, but ideally has a, a good quality connection as well on the latency side. I think as Mike has um, discovered uh, these aspects of, of the consoles, um, we've also done a better job of relaying this information to families that perhaps we 
weren't able to at the very beginning. Um, but we have been much more conscious about deploying a whole bunch of volunteers uh, for uh, families who have questions about their internet connection and hook up and set up and help uh, with their kids as well. Um, and we've set aside tuition assistance funds to help uh, with the accessibility issues, uh, even uh, upgrading uh, internet access when that's necessary for our kids to participate. So um, it, it definitely uh, takes a village and there are a lot of moving pieces. Kent, so, what is, uh, what's Ragazzi working on right now and, and what can we look forward to if we were to, to cruise on over to the Ragazzi YouTube channel or your website? Well, we uh, just debuted our uh, We Rise Again, I want to call it a rehearsal video. Uh, that was a very exciting venture, I think, uh, for Mike and Jack Tripp in that it was uh, over 80 voices uh, singing together. And we think that that might be a record. Um, there are only 49 uh, faces uh, or squares because that's what we have on the, on the Zoom um, recording. Uh, we're still working on figuring out exactly how best to A, record, uh, if the recording is uh, going to be acceptable, can we live stream um, you know, our uh, Ragazzi Virtual Studios into a concert. Um, that's all uh, to be determined. But uh, we are chronicling our adventures uh, on our blog, on our website at ragazzi.org. And we hope to have uh, a, a final uh, concert package uh, sometime in December uh, for this semester. And I think we have a clip we can show of the uh, of, of previous rehearsal, a recent rehearsal you guys have had. What, uh, yeah. What so that's uh, We Rise Again. Uh, it was put together in basically two rehearsals uh, with our co uh, Sorry, with our concert group, which is our uh, most experienced treble ensemble and our young men's ensemble, which are our high school changed voices group, uh, totaling over 80 voices. Mike, are you thinking that that's the record? Was the record then? I think so. I haven't heard of anybody who's, uh, who's gotten to that level. I mean, as far as I know, like most of the other technologies available hit a, hit a limit much lower. Um, a lot of them use a P2P technology that can only handle up to five to 10 people. Um, others that, that use the, a similar client server technology, um, every indication I've seen is that it, it maxes out around 40 to 50 participants. So with JackTrip, we've, we've managed to push it much further than I think anybody's been able to do before. And uh, it, that's over 80 people right now. Like we're, we're hoping we could do a larger tests as we go, larger and larger. And um, we also have done synthetic testing um, of up to 500 concurrent uh, connections. So we, we feel like it can scale pretty far to handle likely any, any size chorus out there. Wow, let's, uh, let's take a look at that clip.
Wow, lovely. Thank you, Kent and Mike. Um, I think it's moving to a lot of people to just be able to witness um, people singing together and especially children. Um, thank you for, for this uh, great gift that you've um, helped to give to the choral field. Our pleasure. I mean, even to this day, when I, when I watch it another time, it still makes me tear up a little bit. And our hats are off to, to Mike for his dedicated work uh, all on a volunteer basis to get this up and running. Uh, it's actually amazing. Uh, so kind of wrap up, Mike, what's, uh, what's next for the Jack Tripp Foundation? What kinds of technology things are you guys working on? What's coming up down the line? Definitely the, the number one focus is accessibility. We want to make it available to as many people as possible, not just in the US, but around the world. So rolling out more geographic locations, lowering the bar of internet connectivity requirements. These sort of things are all the, the main focus right now. Uh, in parallel, we're, we're working on, on sound. Uh, we, we think there's a lot, of, a lot of new things that we can do with sound by having everyone on their own unique channel that you can't do otherwise with, with in-person performances. Um, we're, we're working on some, some interesting things with, uh, with auto panning, uh, as well as uh, having, having voices completely surround you 360, uh, working on applying different filters, uh, different, uh, as well as just general audio processing at the server side that you can apply for different types of groups. Uh, for example, a chorus might want to use certain filters, certain compressors, whereas a, a symphony might have a totally different setup that they'd prefer to make their sound optimal. And so we're working on different ways to have different uh, plugins or flexibility server side to adapt to lots of different performing arts groups. That's so exciting. Kent and Mike, thanks so much. It's been a real pleasure. Congratulations and thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you, a pleasure as well. Well, that's really exciting. It's so great to hear that the technology is right around the corner where people can start singing together at the same time, even if we're a little remote from everyone else. Yeah, and I know the technology is not available everywhere quite yet, um, but I know that we're going to be in close communication with Jack Tripp um, about the developments and you know anything that, that we can do to help speed along that technology to everyone. Yeah, it's a very exciting time. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited for what's just in the, the future horizon for us. Uh, speaking of horizon, Mike, we have another video podcast series that is launching uh, right around the same time as Cortex is. Can you tell us a little more about that? Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's the very near horizon, in fact. Um, I'm going to be co-hosting a series um, with Alex Blake, who is an LA-based choral musician and the founder and artistic director of a group called tonality that sings about social justice issues and this series is going to be called rising voices and we're going to have conversations about diversity equity inclusion and kind of what of our next real tangible steps are um, there's been a lot of reaction um, this summer to racial injustice um, a lot of statements that have been very good but now it's now it's time to be like okay what's next um, and how can, in the choral field, how can we make real meaningful change? So I'm really excited about that. I'm very grateful to Alex uh, for being a partner in this. Yeah, I've been editing the series and just hearing you guys talk and the ideas that you guys are uh, working on for the next couple of interviews, it's, it's really exciting. And I'm, I think this is going to be really big for us and a big help for people that are listening uh, for this kind of information. Absolutely. Um, and well, and you're, you're still a big part of that series too. You know, you won't be on camera or on camera as much, but like you're a super important part of that too, Casey. Well, thank you. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of work, but it's, it's work that needs to be done. And I think, I think you guys are going to help a lot of people and reach a lot of people that need to hear this kind of stuff. I hope so. Uh, speaking of people that need to hear this kind of stuff, uh, we're looking for people to send us uh, a little help in the music department. Uh, we are, we're looking for sort of main theme music for this show and some transition music. Uh, what we need is people that are willing to just sing or perform or something uh, and allow us to use it. Um, we can't use, you know, your favorite recording of, you know, the 
Mozart C minor mass. We need to have like music sort of written for this. It'd be best if it was sort of hums or oohs and o's, so it, we can use it as transition kind of music. Uh, Mike, anything else we need for something like this? Well, just to reiterate, I mean, the only choral music that we can use right now is the stuff that we can sing right here. So until we until we get that that perfect submission or submissions, I think I'm just going to sing our outro music. All right, take it away, Mike. All right. Cortex, 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 cortex. It's a Halloween so, week special the so with the minor third and the major seventh. So <laughs> please send us your music or else I, I Casey is going to force me to do this every episode. I will. And I guarantee you that they only get worse from there. So thanks so much for tuning in this week. Uh, we will see you. Uh, we're hoping to do one of these a month. So uh, this was our October version. We should be releasing these coming up soon in November. So stay tuned and we'll see you next time. Thanks everybody. Take care. Cortez.